different examples of uh, ways I, I have used um, open education resources in my teaching. But yeah, there's one example in particular that's kind of fresh uh, that, that might be illuminating for everybody. Uh, I mean, I in some courses, if I, I have some reading heavy courses, yeah, I teach Victorian novels, things like this. So sometimes if I want students to be able to get a jump on the reading, I will refer them to Project Gutenberg editions of those novels before they even get their print copies, uh, just so that they can get a jump on the reading. And I know that the Project Gutenberg, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's it's pretty robust and, and uh, they, you know, they're maybe not the prettiest editions, but I, I think there's something to be said for for them being kind of dependable and authoritative editions. Um, I all I, I quite often uh, send students in my courses, both undergraduate and graduate, to um, open online guides for things like uh, writing literary criticism um, or practicing citation styles. There are some excellent open resources for those, and I'm sure uh, many people who here will know about them too. Um, in some cases uh, with graduate students, I'll, I'll share copies of my own open access publications if it's relevant to what they're working on in their own studies. Um, I recently had the occasion to relicense one of my own open access publications in part for because it was forming part of a chapter that I'm having published uh, in a new book that's just out. Um, and uh, so that was an interesting case of kind of relicensing something that, that was mine. You know, typically publishers approach you and they say, well, we want copyright in this if we're going to publish it. And I said, well, you can't actually have it in this case because this was already published. Uh, and they were actually OK with it in a rare instance. So hats off to the U of Delaware Press for being OK with my my uh, open relicensing effort. Um, but the uh, the fresh example is something that's kind of recently happened in the music course that I administer. Um, Sound and Sense in Listening, Music 267 at Athabasca U. So this is a course um, that for a long time has used uh, an accompanying, well, it, for a while it was a CD uh, of, of songs that had been selected by the textbook publisher um, as illustrative examples of listening to music and, and things to listen for. Uh, we got told last year by the publisher that they would not renew our, uh, our license for access to those music samples so that actually you know when i heard that from our course materials people they're like the publisher doesn't want to renew your music clips that put the course on a very short deadline to closure unless we came up with a satisfying workaround so i talked to the tutors of the course and one of them uh, achilles Ziacris, had the very ingenious idea to just uh and it was a fair bit of work for him to do this too but what he did was uh, he, he just systematically went through YouTube and found equivalent clips that were sort of publicly available uh, through YouTube um, and kind of created a, an alternate web page of all of the music clips that we had just lost our license for from the from the official publisher. So we were able to reconstitute that learning resource just by using materials that I'm not going to say they're not in the public domain. Like they're out in public, like there's a lot of stuff that's publicly available on YouTube. It isn't necessarily public domain, right? It's still uh, uh, copyright protected or whatnot. And it's true, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that maybe shouldn't be on YouTube, but that's not really for us to decide. We're not out to, you know, enforce other people's copyright decisions. YouTube can do that. Um, but it's certainly no infringement or, or, or there's no uh, problem for us to link to any publicly uh, available resources out there on the open web. So we were able to reconstitute uh, a resource to which we'd lost a license by just finding equivalents out there on the on the open web. Um, you know, it's a high enrollment course for a lot of students, depending on being able to access uh, these materials. So, uh, as, you know, to, uh, and that has worked uh, pretty well as, as a workaround. It's true that things may come and go from YouTube. Things can sometimes vanish if they get maybe cease and desisted <laughs> off of YouTube. Um, so we do have to kind of check in from time to time, make sure all those links are still working and such. But uh, it's it's proven a very uh, an efficient um, solution to a, to a licensing crisis. Um, I guess, yeah, I think that's maybe all I'll say about an example of something that's sort of recently uh, happened in terms of how we administer our courses. That's a great example. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, Rachel, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, just to okay. take a step, a step back here. Um, what would you say is the difference between a license and copyright? Well, my goodness, um, copyright is a thing, so it's uh, 
automatic and in full force as soon as you put something onto a tangible item. So, so you write something and uh, then, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a thing. So um, the, the rights are um, long lasting and sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, yeah. Sorry. I think I'm having tech uh, tech problems here. Yeah, you can um, for a second. Yeah. So, anyways, copyright's a thing. Um, as soon as you you put a work into a, a, a fixed format, um, you have all the rights, and um, you should be able to benefit economically from it. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the difference between uh, like a, like an all rights reserved model and a uh, some rights reserved model, which is like Creative Commons, is, is that it allows users to to know exactly how how you you want people to to use and interpret and distribute your work, right? In a very easy, uh, tangible way. So maybe a license is kind of like a formalized permission and it's kind of um, that everyone can use rather than a specific person to person agreement. I see we have a question in chat so we can uh, hop into that. Um, this is from Dr. Dr. Lorraine Thursk. I created a couple of resources for a course. I would like to share this with my nurse educated network, but don't want people to modify it. Similarly, we created an animated video as part of our research knowledge mobilization. It would like it to be shared widely, but not modified. What kind of licenses do I need? Or can I just put these up on YouTube with the attribution in the description? So that's really a two part question. There's a couple of different directions we can take that. Um, maybe I'll say a three part question. Um, so in order to use Creative Commons licenses, uh, there's no fee, there's no um, application process. You can just apply it. Um, and if you wanted to create something and not let people modify it, you would want to include a no derivative clause. So that would be an ND if you want to use a Creative Commons license, for example. Um, and the third part of that question would be uh, the U University of Athabasca's um, intellectual property policy. So if you were um, an employee, Technically, everything you make belongs to the university um, or the copyright. Uh, if you're doing things as part of your research, uh, that is yours and you are, you can choose to openly license that. So you can still um, openly license content that you create as an employee. However, um, that will have to go through a different process. So um, it really depends on the university you're at, uh, your specific situation. I hope that helps answer your question. Um, this is probably a great time to ask, does anyone else have any other questions? There is a there is a raise hand feature uh, in, in your top menu there that might just help to organize the uh, conversation. And I see we have another question from Dr. David Anand. Does anyone have news about AU copyrighted material being released as CC? Um, mm -hmm. It's Sorry, I'll, yeah, I'll speak to that. Um, so AU owns the content, um, but fortunately and unfortunately for for all the faculty. Um, but uh, huh, dang, I really hope so. Um, I think I'd really like to see a model, like a model license, like a model CC license um, that the university could adopt. Um, I don't know if that exists, but right now I think the process is hmm, the university owns your content. Um, but what happens when you when when you rework uh, you uh, or, or remix it, and then it becomes something else? You know, um, and I think honestly, um, like a Creative Commons license is where we need to land on this sort of thing. Totally. Go ahead. You're going to say something. Yeah, I, I, David's question uh, seems to imply we're talking about educational 
content here because the 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 university's intellectual property policy is quite clear that the university owns uh, copyright in teaching and service content that employees create. But as you said, the research um, is the uh, intellectual property of the individual researcher. Um, so um, I think in this case, we're talking about either education or service materials uh, being released under kind of Creative Commons licensing. Um, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of examples of this happening, um, but I, I, I agree that maybe more of it sort of could be happening. Um, although there's a lot of stuff that we do provide that's just, again, out there on the open web. The library provides uh, quite a number of um, open educational resources. From time to time uh, in the past and continuing through now, we, we have some um, university systems, uh, some more experimental than others, let's say, like the um, Athabasca Landing, which was a, a social uh, software site that was uh, adopted in the early 2010s and, and kind of a, a project to use it was spearheaded by uh, Dr. John Drawn. Um, and it's still in use uh, among some students and faculty. And I've used that as a place where I would sort of um, post things like rubrics, you know, rubrics of expectations for what I look for uh, in, in student papers um, or outlines of how to go about doing a close reading. So I've, I've created some uh, resources that uh, that are there and I wouldn't presume to have copyright in them now because the policy has been clarified. Um, so I mean, it's a bit of a question mark what actually might happen to a lot of the content that's uh, shared in a social site like that. But um, I'm just trying to think of other examples of AU copyrighted material uh, that that gets Creative Commons license. That's not really the same as what we do at uh, Athabasca University Press, um, because again, the copyright there belongs to the individual author. So the press requests a, a Creative Commons license to put on top of that. So everything they publish is both open access uh, and Creative Commons licensed. But again, that's sort of more on the research side, not so much the teaching and, and service side. So, yeah, I, I think that and, and it's a different. Uh, let me add, it's a different situation. I think at most of the universities, uh, among those I've surveyed, it's more common to have university policy that assigns uh, copyright in teaching service and research, basically in everything, to the individual faculty members. Um, it's somewhat more unusual, although not unheard of, for the university to retain copyright ownership in the teaching and service materials. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Uh, there's another question in chat. I think it's can I call you later? Um, sure, you're welcome to. <laughs> oh, we're open for uh, more uh, conversations moving, moving forward, absolutely. Um, just to speak to, to Dave's question uh, real quick, I know that there are conversations happening right now about uh, standard licenses and creating that kind of pipeline, that um, um, pathway for material to be openly licensed, um, or at least a model of what that would look like. But as of right now, there's no concrete um, decisions made, it's just conversations happening. But uh, yeah, it's exciting to time to be part of uh, AU and for it, sure. And it's super exciting. And I hope that whatever like model license we choose should be super non-restrictive. Like it should be like very open, right? Um, and and I don't know, you've, you've talked about uh, the CC licensing and the ranges of use, um, but I think for university, it's important that um, the less restrictions we apply, the better, you know? Yeah, that's a great point and a great kind of segue to my next uh, uh, prompt here that I have. And my prompt was asking about uh, how do you combine different content together? If you have, say, um, two works that you really want to create one OER with and they have different licenses. How does that work? Um, and that's a more complicated question because some licenses uh, include the share alike license, which means you have to release something under the same license. Um, so that can be restrictive. Um, for example, if you want to um, release something that uh, you are allowing for uh, commercial derivatives to be made. You can't then include parts of a resource that have a NC um, clause because then you'd be violating that um, license. 
So there's a little bit of nuance around combining different licenses, but a lot of the time it can be done. Um, and if you ever want to know, you can just contact me. Any more questions in the chat? Or you're welcome to, to uh, take yourself off mute and, and join the conversation as well. Hope you have a great question here. From Mike McLean. From observation, I look at courses where we lack license from some of the big publishers. Example, uh, e-textbook. It seems like an abrupt change in the publisher side. Terminating support for a resource um, can have a real impact on our students. Our CDP teams seem to be scrambling on a regular basis to deal with external factors of this nature. Investing in the development of OERs for our courses provides an alternative, but then you have a serious commitment maintaining a resource. That's a financial and time commitment, and hard to say that we are in a position to maintain that over time. Is this a fair or basic way to look at some, uh, one of the tensions or choices we face right now? Um, I can start to answer that question say absolutely. If we want to have a space for stable OER, our own space here at AU, um, there's a lot of maintenance that goes on there. Um, there's work that has to be done in terms of developing resources. Um, yeah, there's a lot of coordination to go on. Uh, it, Maybe something I can take on parts of, but you know, um, as a project grows, you might have not just one or two OER, you, you might have tens or hundreds, right? So um, those are great cons considerations. Um, absolutely. Does anyone else want to, to touch on that question? Uh, maybe I'll come at it a bit sideways. Uh, something that I've been thinking about is um, what seems to me to be a growing need to be able to establish provenance for given uh, open education resources. Uh, and I've done this by making the unfortunate mistake of sort of Googling my, my own work <laughs> just to see what's happened to it. Uh, because I just, I went looking for something that I know I'd put in the institutional repository, uh, AU space, which is where faculty members and, and people who are producing and writing research can self archive um, research work in, in an open way or a closed way if needed, but anyway. I went looking for stuff that was in the repository that was mine. And what I found instead was a link to a ResearchGate page, ResearchGate being one of these sort of proprietary um, walled garden type firms uh, where it, it sort of invites people to share their research product there, um, but isn't really strictly speaking a, a kind of an open repository or anything, it's a, it's a private company. Uh, I found a listing of my own stuff on ResearchGate um, and it, it, all the titles had links under them like, you know, click here to request a copy. And well, I thought, well, that's odd because I don't actually have a ResearchGate account. So I've written to them and I've uh, told them to remove that page, um, mainly because I thought it was interfering with search engine results, right? So uh, when stuff circulates, like it, it's, it's kind of the trade-off. There's a risk with um, having stuff out, out there in the open because uh, it, you, you do um, expose it to all kinds of unknown appropriations um, and, and reproductions and stuff. So I've been wondering about ways uh, we might establish sort of authoritative sources for these. So I'd mentioned a place like Project Gutenberg. I think our own institutional repository um, is, is a good sort of uh, anchoring site to, to establish. You know, this is the legitimate source for this particular um, uh, open resource or whatever. Uh, but I, I, I do think some work needs to happen there. And maybe also some work needs to happen in terms of search engine optimization. Um, by universities, just to make sure that it's the universities, a university like ours is showing up as, as the top result, as the authoritative source for a given resource, rather than having any number of legitimate or not so legitimate intermediaries show up in the top search results, because it, it misinforms students, among other things. Um, and it's it's uh, making a bit of a mess of the um, online educational milieu. There's kind of a whole related thing I could do on that, but uh, I, I, the, the main point I think is just that, um, yeah, uh, there's um, there's a need to be able to point to authoritative sources for good material. Uh, and that is always part of the challenge of doing any research online, but I think particularly so when it comes to looking for solid and quality uh, open ed resources. Definitely. That's a great point. I see that David's hand is up, but we'll first uh, address Jim's question. Who's, who's, who is first? 
um, I have seen works with a copyright notice, which is uh, an author's name, uh, and a CC BY notice. I'm curious about how that works, if there's a hierarchy of permissions or if one supersedes the other. So that's a great example of the difference between um, copyright and the license. So right now, if you are creating content um, as an individual, uh, say if I drew a picture, I have a copyright license automatically applied to that. So that would be uh, copyright Dan Cocroft. Um, if I want to share that, I can uh, create what's called a license. So I can apply permissions to it. Instead of saying um, just from me to you, this uh, item, you may use it in a specific way. I can apply a license to it. So that's a, um, a broad statement that allows anyone to use it on my specific terms. So in that case, uh, CC BY um, license means essentially that they can use it in any way they want uh, as long as I am still attributed. So I still have that, that copyright. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and go ahead, Dave. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for those comments. Uh, those are really interesting, all of them. Uh, I don't know, this is a little AU-centric. I don't know if it really fits the bill here or not, but I just want to throw this question out, to, particularly to Rachel and Mark. I think, Dan, you and I might have had these discussions, but whether there's any impetus or discussion in the institution, not just about licensing the AU copyrighted material, educational material, as Mark rightly inferred, uh, as creative under a Creative Commons license, but if there's been any discussion or realization about the unique situation that AU is in to produce its own material that perhaps, hopefully, could be then distributed as OER. Um, for instance, if I write OER, I can. it's considered scholarly activity for a professor. So in terms of time, the cost of that is, is nothing because it's either it's like my research time or my workload time you know it's uh, there's there's very little uh, cost opportunity cost to me doing that the other thing that's unique about au is that the cost of the material is impounded in the tuition fees and if we can replace say a text or commercial textbook with in-house produced material then we get the savings to that to the extent that it's not passed on to students. So there is an argument for passing it on, but that's a unique situation because in other institutions, virtually every other institution, the cost of those textbooks is external to the university itself. It doesn't realize the savings. So there's no impetus, no imperative for say faculty members to write their own material. It's not, it's done sort of off the side of their desk at midnight. It's uh, probably done for commercial venture and um, they won't put the effort into it or and they'll always choose a commercial text because it makes their job of teaching easier and i i don't think that any of those things apply at au so i think we're in a unique position to increase our oer if we could get say a database as you're talking about to assemble and manage that material i think we could really go somewhere with uh, our own material and especially if we could license it as oer we just have a lot of factors in play here that could incentive and incentivize production. Wow, that's really cool and uh, totally um, understandable. Um, I think a lot of faculty members get lost um, in the process of course development per se, you know, like uh, what happens when your textbook goes out of print and you have to reinvent the wheel. It's um, it happens a lot. And Mark shared a story about that. So. Yeah, I think there's really interesting opportunities that uh, you described there, David, and I, I think um, I, I don't know specifically where to look for the institutional will to follow those up, but I, I expect there'd be sort of strong appetite, uh, both administratively and then among um, some faculty for doing that. I say some because uh, the situation you described, I, I think, doesn't really work for all disciplines. Uh, there are some dis disciplines that are, are still going to really rely on uh, on books. Um, in, in some form or another that are externally produced. So, I mean, I teach I teach English. I'm not going to start just writing novels <laughs> to replace the the much better ones that are out there by by publishers. Um, 
and, or you know philosophy and history those are other disciplines where they sort of rely on uh, external texts classics right um so but certainly there are uh, also a great many disciplines and fields in which um it, it's known that you know textbooks maybe um get updated too often maybe more as a result of sort of uh publishers business models um, that don't necessarily work with universities schedules uh, certainly at a university like ours that doesn't have the kind of semester um, scheduling of its its courses, uh, it, it does pose real trouble if um, publishers suddenly update textbooks. And maybe maybe the update is, maybe they just changed a, a very minor amount of things, put a new cover on it uh, and, and send it out there. Um, and, and it creates maybe an ordinate work for um, the way we teach that book uh, at the university. So yeah, I could see cases like that uh, in which developing our own sort of um, library of open ed resources would be very um, efficient. It would be very, uh, it could become a very sort of ro robust source of, of pedagogical excellence and expertise. Um, I, I would just, I, I guess I'd, my comment is just a footnote to say, I'm not sure that that would be one size that would fit all necessarily. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And, I, and just to add on that, um, it's obviously difficult to create your own resource, um, but with the nature of open licensing, you could also adapt uh, existing works. You can grab chapters that you like. You can cut chapters that you like, depending on what's out there. So that's a uh, that's something you could do. Uh, we have another question from Mike. It's very much a question of coordination and collaboration across jurisdictions, also. Where do we have the capacity to author and maintain uh, example taxation and accounting resources? Surely some other public university in Canada could be building excellent pediatric textbooks, or is that too much of a stretch? Uh, that's absolutely right. That's basically what's just what I was saying. There's there's lots of opportunities there for uh, existing resources that are openly licensed. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure we got to uh, was Rachel and I had talked previously about um, an interesting uh, situation she came across. The student who wanted to think about um, openly licensing their dissertation. Uh, Rachel, could you remind me of the uh, exact situation? Sure. Uh, so uh, a student approached me with a copyright question and uh, she was like, I don't want to necessarily deposit my work into our digital thesis repository under Creative Commons license because I've been approached by a publisher um, and I might want to uh, sell it, right? So what does that mean for the student? And, and honestly, I'm, I'm pro like um, Creative Commons and yes, yes, please license your stuff openly. Um, that's a very altruistic kind of um, discourse, I guess. But in this case, it was kind of like, no, um, maybe you shouldn't do that. So. Yeah, there's definitely considerations uh, beyond just uh, seeing open as good or bad. Uh, there's different use cases for different things. Um, in that case, um, openly licensing as something like a dissertation might impact your ability to get published in the future just based on what those publishers are looking for. Um, and one of the things that they could do as, as an example is they could um, negotiate with the uh, publisher um, to openly, re sorry, openly license uh, and release their content in the future after embargo period. So I know for some of the big um, um, awards you can win like a, a shark or something, those often have clauses in them where you have to release your work openly. So they will allow you to, <clears throat> um, after an embargo period, release that on an institutional repository, uh, usually open access. Uh, so we have another question here. Um, you had mentioned briefly the distinction between open access and OER. Can you elaborate further on the distinction between the two and the potential for using OAM? materials in conjunction with OER? That's an excellent question. Um, so 
like I said, usually the distinction happens between uh, no derivatives and derivatives. So um, you'll have a resource that you're able to access, but not modify, uh, that will be open access. Uh, whereas OER, typically you are able to modify that in some way uh, to make derivatives. Um, so using those two together are, is usually very difficult. Um, you could uh, link them to each other, um, that type of thing, but combining them is not something you can do. Uh, does anyone else want to add on to that? Uh, I'd be interested to hear um, from there are likely audience members here who can uh, explain the distinction much better than than I could. But I, I see it as a sort of difference in sort of use and context. Like I tend to think of open access in the context of how do I want my work published? How do I want my work to be accessible or not accessible? Um, what are the terms under which I want my work distributed? And then I think of open ed resources as basically I think of it more from the user side. Uh, I mean, I have created this or that, but I think of it more as a user side question, like is um, what what do I need to be able to teach effectively? Uh, and, and can I find it um, on the open web? Can I find it uh, out there uh, among other uh, repositories? Uh, it, it, so something that may be published under open access auspices could become an open ed resource. Um, if used in a in a certain way, so I think it's I, I tend to think of it. One is maybe more on the production side, and the other is maybe more on the distribution and, and use and reception side. Um, although you know, people are publishing stuff under open access licenses. People are also creating things designed to be open education resources too. So uh, yeah, like I said, there's probably somebody who could better <laughs> explain the distinction th than I can. Um, but you know, I like I. So for my book, which was with uh, Athabasca U Press, ah, look, it's invisible. Wait, anyway, I just, it, it keeps going away. Anyway, the point is there's a photo on the cover of my book that was, I, I just found it online and it was at, I don't know, Flickr or something. And um, it was a photo that had a Creative Commons license attached to it that allowed for the use of it, um, you know, as in, in, in any way. And so the, I talked about it with the press and they were, they double checked the licensing and we went with it. We had, didn't have to actually pay any licensing fee or anything to, to use that uh, pretty dramatic photo on the, on the cover of the book. So that was, again, you know, using something that had been shared openly um, in the process of creating an open access work. And so I, I think, I, I think it maybe is more of a spectrum than a firm distinction. I don't know if that helps. I'm just here to muddy the waters, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <that's great. laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> it might also be worth noting that um, it's always worthwhile to just go ahead and ask if you want to use something. Um, often um, authors will give you permission to use um, their works in, in different ways. Um, so that would be example of an individual license or a permission. Yeah, so, so please go ahead and ask. Uh, I think this is a great point to ask again if anyone has any questions. There's lots of great chat going on, uh, so I'm reading that. While we are waiting for like more chat to happen, which I hope it does, yay. Um, this one time, um, I there was a behavioral psychologist uh, professor at AU who wanted to use a painting in his course as some cover art. Um, that was back when we were still like printing courses and sending stuff out in the mail. Um, anyways, all I had to go on for this painting was the name Kamala. And I was like, oh, cool. Okay, so I'll contact her art studio or whatever, her representation and get permission to use that stuff. Um, it turned out Kamala was an elephant at the Calgary Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no. So we ended up negotiating with the Calgary Zoo to have Kamala's the elephants work published um, on an AU um, course. Um, and I think I think we negotiated an honorarium of like 150 bucks or something. But yeah, that was uh, that was a very cool copyright story. <laughs> Oh, that's a great example. Um, someone's asked, can animals even legally own copyright? That's a good question. I have no idea. 
Um, well, I'm not sure about that. There was like a famous video of like a squirrel taking a picture of people in, in Jasper or something back in the day. Um, but all I know from my AU experience is, is that uh, we had to negotiate some licensing terms for that stuff. <laughs> and uh, hopefully Kamala, you know, got a lot more uh, painting and painting stuff and, you know, peanuts or something. Oh, that's great. I love that. I see another question uh, from Dr. De Lorraine Thirsk. Uh, who do I talk to about public disclosure of course materials? That would be me. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, email me or, or message me at any point. I can spot my email in the chat here. Yeah, there's there's uh, so, so many things to think about for sure. Um, another kind of one one question. Yeah. Can, okay. can I? Oh, sorry. You, you go ahead. You got the agenda. You no. go ahead, Mark. Uh, well, just as I was preparing my notes for this talk, something that occurred to me is, um, and and I, I hope not to sort of monkey wrench anything doing so, but uh, I was wondering about the possible ways in which um, open education resources might uh, pose barriers to access and education for some people. I mean, I, 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 I'm sort of at some level or other, I'm, I'm usually mindful that uh, at least at Athabasca, we have um, certain cohorts, certain populations of students that cannot use the internet, right? And so a lot of the open movement stuff is really grounded in um, a presumption of access to the digital, right? And, and I, I, I just started, uh, I don't have an answer to this question, but it occurs to me that we, we might need to we may not want to, but we might need to think about the ways in which uh, that the digital uh, basis uh, or the presumption of the digital basis for um, open resources and, and open access. Um, what are ways in which that might actually create a, a barrier rather than remove it? Uh, it's like I said, an open question, but one I think we need maybe to think about. Definitely, and and you can see how the landscape has really changed since COVID. Um, different emphasis on different resources that may not be as equitable for everyone. Um, it's kind of a great segue. Yeah, to, there's a comment in the chat about uh, yeah. about neurodivergence. Yeah, they, they make a great point about difficulty reading online if, if people have certain, um, you know, uh, learning styles or learning challenges. Yeah. Yeah, and just with um, sort of publisher materials, the same kind of issues might exist in terms of accessibility. Um, so it's, it's a great segue to our, our next mm -hmm. panel on Wednesday. <laughs> we'll be talking about the quality yep. of um, open uh, educational resources and how, how do we even begin to evaluate that or think about that. So I'm going to drop that link in the chat if you are interested. It's a, happening about the same time. Yay, super fun. Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question. Is there anyone else who wants to uh, drop anything for us to talk about? That's a great point, Ebony. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think I have another kind of interesting question without a real answer. Um, and that's something we we kind of talked about in our meetings was about relicensing content. Um, let's say uh, a textbook goes out of print. Uh, maybe the author passes away um, and the um, person who um, owns that copyright, wants to openly license that work. How does that work? How does uh, that conversation kind of begin? Dang, that's a hard one. Uh, yeah. That begins for <laughs> for me um, doing a lot of research and finding out um, who owns what. Um, so I'm often dealing with estates of, of people who have passed away. Um, and then finding out, hey, there was actually never a digital licensing scheme involved with any of those rights. So I guess, I guess the rights live with the author always. Um, and I would hope, 
um, that uh, they choose to license their stuff uh, openly in the future. I don't know. It makes it makes it um, a lot easier for me um, because copyright is like two centuries of of rules and regulations. So if something can be like more openly accessible, that's really cool, right? Totally. And then there's a lot of work to be thought about. How do you make that that work modern? How do you um, update it with more modern examples and, and that format? Um, I, I know I've heard of, of some cases where they didn't even have a PDF, so they had to scan the each page and sort of OCR it uh, and then fix that. So th there's all kinds of interesting things that happen uh, when openly licensing really old stuff that has has uh, expired. We had another question in the chat about uh, a CCND license. Does that prevent uh, printing or making an audio copy? And uh, Mark's really answered, answered that nicely. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I have. I don't know. That's that's my impression. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I knew it was a it was a topic in the last round of the copyright amendments in 2012. Was I think there was some language that they were proposing that would have really compromised uh, the ability of publishers or, or users or libraries to create accessible versions for say the visually impaired and so forth. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure that the law does allow for that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Though. And I, I, I don't think the Creative Commons licensing would necessarily even apply because I don't think you're making a derivative work in that case. I think you're just translating it into a different medium. Yeah, absolutely. That's my understanding as well. And in, in terms of um, making content accessible. I, I believe we are legally required if a student is requesting material in a printed format or any other uh, accessibility need, we, we must um, uh, make that available, whether that is openly licensed or, or not. Mm -hmm. All right, we have two minutes left. Any other quick questions? Yeah, I wonder if we need more comments on the question of uh, out of print books or or uh, questions of like where you're unsure about the copyright ownership anymore if something's gone out of print or um, in that kind of situation. I'm not sure. All right, that's probably a great place to end off. So thank you all for attending today and please don't hesitate to reach out with any further questions. Uh, so if you haven't signed up already, our next OE week panel is will be on Wednesday and it's talking about uh, evaluating the quality of OER. Um, it'll be held at the same time as this panel. I did drop the link in the chat there. Um, and I'd also like to thank all our panelists for today and uh, especially thank Jordan Habib for her administrative assistance. And thank you for asking all your questions and, and making this a really interesting experience. Um, so take care and don't hesitate to contact me. Cool, thanks.